All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here alongside Anthony Pine of RT Sport Online. And we're joined by Johnny McDonald and Paul Curry this week. If you're tuning into this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, you can watch it on YouTube and also vice versa. Uh, we'll also be reacting to the weekend's SSC or Tristy League action and previewing our live Champions League offering later. But first, the inaugural UEFA Women's Nations League draw was made last week. Ireland were among the top seeds in League B and are grouped with Northern Ireland, Hungary and Albania. The winner gets promoted to League A and second goes into the promotion playoffs. And the matches are going to take place between September and early December. So essentially, it's the first big challenge for Vera Pau's side after the World Cup. And Anthony, in regards to the draw and how it's panned out, Ireland would look to be in a strong position to get promotion to League A. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the first thing to say about this, Raf, is um, last summer, Vera Pell, and this was mooted, this new Nations League format, um, she was strongly against it because, um, as we know from watching her Ireland team, her philosophy is that to get better, you have to play the best teams. And this format will deprive um, the sort of second and third tier teams. Um, they'll have fewer opportunities to play the top nations basically there, there's much less scope now for international friendlies so if you're in league a um with the likes of england and france and spain and the dutch uh, as scotland and wales are actually in in league in league a excuse me um you're going to get to play the top teams on a regular basis and that does hasten improvement and that's certainly Vera Pell's view of it ireland are in league b um as you say the top ranked team in league b they're 22nd in the world currently Northern Ireland are 45th, Hungary are 41st, Albania are 72nd. So they would be strongly fancy to win League B and get promoted to League, uh, to League A. But there'll be two years of playing second tier opposition. Uh, and her fear is that in those two years that the, the teams in League A will race away, like their, their development will, will be quicker um, and there will be a, a bigger gulf. The gulf will be widened as a result. I mean, this was brought in to try and wipe away games like, like Ireland bet Georgia 12 nil, and we've seen other really cricket score games. And um, in fairness, UEFA tried to this this is trying to address that by by pairing teams of similar level together. But her her view would be that really um you know to, to bring those teams on, they should actually be playing the better teams more regularly. That's that's how you learn and that's that's how you improve. Um, but look, it is what it is. I mean, they are very important matches because they feed into the European um, qualification campaign. That How you do in the Nations League directly impacts your seeding for qualification for the Euros in 2025. So a really strong Nations League will, will give Ireland a, a great chance of making the Euros. You know, basically, once it comes to the qualification pan- campaign for the Euros, um, again, it will be a league system. I think a three-tier league system. And if you finish in the top eight in League A, you go directly to the finals. But you know, if Ireland have a strong Nations League, they'll pretty much guarantee themselves a place in the playoffs as a minimum. So a lot riding on them. Um, there'll be good games, you know, taking on Northern Ireland, a bit of a derby feel, international derby feel about that. Um, but it is important to sort of to to to, to stress that Vera Pell is not a big fan of this approach. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. You know, it could be beneficial to Ireland because, as I said, they do have a strong Nations League. Um, they'll have a really good safety net to at least get into the playoffs for the Euros. Yeah, and Paul, like we've seen in the men's game, there's at least been three uh, iterations of the Nations League, and obviously Ireland have been in League B through throughout, and probably haven't had the the best results in that competition compared to say in qualifiers. But uh, do you feel? Like the what we've seen in the men's game at the Nations League that has actually been beneficial. Yeah, I think it's worked well, Raf. I think the no, I, I take Vera's point about playing the the kind of top nations team in games, but we have to remember that they're non-competitive. And when we're playing those nations, a lot of the time they're probably trying out things with their own games or formations or systems or new players. And if we are to get ourselves out of League B and into League A, well, then you find yourself playing against those top nations teams in competitive games. And that has been the main, I guess, take home from the men's side of the Nations League is that what were international windows that kind of came and passed us by with non-competitive friendlies has now become really competitive games. I was probably against the Nations League idea when it first came in, but I think it's been a huge success. And if it gives us another avenue to qualify for major competitions while developing some of our our better talented players, I think it's a win-win. And for Vera and for the squad, 
it's getting out of League B as soon as we possibly can to ensure that we're playing those top nations team like Anthony mentioned. Yeah, and Johnny, similarly, uh, what's like? have you enjoyed the Nations League campaigns over the last while, at least in the men's game? Obviously, the women's are going to experience the same thing, but as Vera Pau has outlined, there are um, kind of issues with it for teams that aren't in the, the top tier. Yeah, well, just you know, just a couple of things on it. You, you know, I, I agree with Paul on the competitive side of it. You know, as whereas before the, the Nations League, it was, yeah, we, we play a friendly, we try out players. Whereas it's it's so competitive now and the points are at stake, your status of where you finish in the in the in the league determines where you're you're gonna go. Uh, in relation to the, the women's, you know, the way for draw, it it's probably where we, we were drawn. It's where you're you are you are supposed to be, I suppose. You know, you know, one thing is talking about you know, Ireland could go on and be Hungary or Albania and Northern Ireland and, and that's fine. And that merits air, you know, reward for going into into the A League. So Probably before qualifying for the World Cup and all that, that's probably where their status was, Raph. And I think you know they can only go off that. And uh, but look, for them to play in the competitive league, you know, if Ireland go and play against you know England or Holland or France or whatever in the A League, and you know they're not getting on level, we're not getting on level. So by playing and winning the, the B division, maybe we're bridging that gap, and that will prepare us. I know it might take a year or two, but I think you know it might prepare us for getting into the A League. And 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 and, comp- and competing uh, you, you know in the A League and substantially in that league. Yeah, and Anthony, in regards to the World Cup, obviously the uh, the squad is still going to be taking shape, but uh, there's some good news in, in terms of the Liverpool duo at least. So Nee Fahey and Leanne Kiernan made the bench uh, at the weekend. Now they didn't they didn't play, but uh, they're still they're still a little while away from like full fitness. Yeah, um, another more headaches for Vera Pell. What good headaches, positive headaches. And Nee Fahey is usually influential. Like, She's been out since January, and um, she'll she'll go to Australia. You know, such an experienced, good defender. Um, the emergence of Eva Mannion is is the interesting thing here. Now, I don't think the fact he's in danger of being squeezed out. I think she's too strong and, and too important to that squad. But it makes it really difficult. I mean, I think we've spoken before about Savannah McCarthy is back from her ACL and she's playing again, which is brilliant. But it just makes it really difficult to see someone like Savannah make it now. Um. Leanne Kiernan, you know, she she's basically missed the whole season. You know, she she got an injury, bad injury, very early in the campaign. Uh, then she relapsed, to, which delayed her recovery. There's only two league games left, Raf. Uh, she didn't feature at the weekend, so uh, I, I guess like for her, there there will be a number of friendlies where she potentially might get a chance to come in. But um, look, she she has only started three times under Vera Pell. You know, Heather Payne was the go-to striker there, and then Amber Barrett was was sort of ahead of Leanne in the pecking order. I would like to see Leanne Kiernan involved. I hope she does make it because I think she's something a little bit different in an attacking sense. She's a poacher. She's really good around the box and she's a good finisher. But from what we've seen in the last couple of years, <clears throat> uh, I know Kira Caruso came in in the, in the friendly games in the USA and did very, very well, actually. But generally, Vera Pearl tends to like workers, worker bees. You know, that's why Heather Payne kept her place up front for so long. She's not, Heather Payne is not a goal scorer. She, she's only scored once in 32 Caps, I think, 32, 33 caps. Leanne Kiernan is a goal scorer, but her work is in an, inside the box. Her best work comes inside the box. And I don't think that's what the manager is looking for. Like she 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 wants people to run the channels. You know, Caruso is very good at holding the ball up, bringing midfield runners into play and things like that, which is not Leanne's strength. So I think she'll find it difficult to make it. But it's great to see her back. She's she's She had been brilliant for Liverpool in the championship when they won the championship and got promoted. She had a great season. And she's just been very, very unfortunate. But you never know. You never know. As I said, there's there's games against there's a, a June friendly, there's a friendly against France in July, and there'll be two more games in when they get to Australia. So you, you never know, as I said, because she is something a little different. Yeah, and at the France game that you speak of, actually, there's uh the first Irish women to be capped for Ireland all the way back or to you know play for Ireland in the first official international, uh, and that was back in 1973 against Wales. They're gonna be making an appearance uh, and on Friday, there was a 50th anniversary reunion of that first team that played in the first official international. I was at it, and there's a piece uh, that I've 
put up online on rt.ie slash sport um, on Saturday if anybody wants to have a kind of read back and just a little bit of the history of that those first few games and also some of the players that were involved and the challenges that they had to that they had to kind of hurdle as well and it's all part of the FAI's 50 year celebrations of women's and girls soccer we're going to talk about the women's premier division a little bit later on but we're going to start with the uh, SSE or Tristy League premier division and at the weekend managerless Cork City lost 3-2 at home to St. Pat's who also don't have a permanent manager at the moment. Derry City won 1-0 away at Drada United. Shamrock Rovers beat Bohemians 2-0 in the Derby, uh, which was live on RT2 in the RT player. Shells beat UCD 1-0 and then Dundalk won 1-0 at Sligo Rovers with uh, Keith Ward, the smallest man on the pitch, uh, heading in laid on for the winner there. But we're going to start with the uh, Derby at Tala and uh, Trevor Clark got the player of the match for Shamrock Rovers and scored the opening goal. So let's listen to him. He was chatting to Tony O'Donoghue. Yeah, no, look, it's always a great atmosphere in Tala Stadium. Um, and obviously the game that's in it, uh, the four points ahead of us. But every week we come into the game, we focus on ourselves. We work hard in training every day and it goes to show tonight uh, what performance we put on and a massive three points. Three goals for you so far this season as well. Is that, is that something you've been able to add to your game? Yeah, no, look, I think uh, obviously at the start of the season, uh, I could have had a lot more goals um, than I have right now, but uh, they're starting to hit the back of the net. So uh, I'm delighted with that. And obviously, I wouldn't have the goals without the team uh, that I have around me as well. You were bursting forward specifically in the in the first half. I mean, the energy, did, did you end up with a, a bit of an injury? Yeah, no, look, uh, I think early on I just got a couple of knocks, uh, but uh, I'm now I'm all right now at the minute, so uh, thankfully running in behind paid off in the end and I got me goal. You certainly did. Congratulations, you're the player of the match. Well done. Cheers, thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, so that was Shamrock Rovers' wing back, left wing back, uh, Trevor Clark, chatting to Tony O'Donoghue after uh, the derby. 2 0 win for Shamrock Rovers. He scores uh, the first goal from a rebound. And Johnny, in regards to Trevor Clark's performances across the season, um, he was obviously very busy during the uh, the derby itself. He seemed to be involved uh, in quite a lot of situations even before he uh, he got the goal. But he has actually been adding that to his game um, this se- in this season anyway. And uh, what have you made of him um, so far during the campaign? He's 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 a very durable player. He, he can play he can play wing back. He can play left back. He can play orthodox wide outside left. You know, he's great pace. Uh, he can do the work on forward. He can do the work on back. He links up really well with the midfield and in the way Rovers play. Sometimes the central midfielders come out wide and train. Play the overload, overload positions, but uh, seen him against Pats recently as well. Got a fantastic goal that night, also. But uh, full of energy from the start of the game, the other night, just picked it up kind of in an old fashioned way, took the, the defenders on 1v1 and all day long and said, Look, I'm going to be doing this all night. But uh, linked up really well in the game and was, was in the right place at the right time for the goal, for the first goal, also coming in off the line, uh, it got uh, making it. Getting in from a good save, but uh, look, he, he he's trying to cement this place down in that team, and it's really really difficult with the squad that Shamrock Rovers have. Look at the bench that he have and the players that he can bring on and the rotation. But look, look, he's in a he's in a brilliant frame of form at the moment, and uh, you know I think Stephen Bradley will be using him in in, in the future. Yeah, and Paul. Yeah, and, and Paul, in regards to to Trevor Clark, I mean. I remember in August of last year, Joey Barton was quite harsh about him when he was at Bristol Rovers and, you know, saying stuff like can't trust him in his position and all this kind of stuff. So um, it's important for him as a player also to just, uh, you know, have this kind of period of stability as well at a club that obviously he knows very well in the shape of Shamrock Rovers. I think it was always going to take him a bit of time when he first came back, Raph, purely on the basis because he didn't play a huge amount of football under Joey Barton at Bristol Rovers. Prior to that, he'd had a... Uh, crucial ligament injury. So if you, if you actually rewind over the last maybe two, three years, Trevor hasn't played a huge amount of football. So there was going to be maybe a bit of a betting in period for him. Sean Cavan has done exceptionally well at left wing back as well. And him being out of the team has just opened it up for Trev. And like like any player, once you get a, a couple of games under your belt, you can start to come back towards your, your natural sharpness. And I think we've seen that in previous weeks. He's a very sort of resilient character. I know Trev haven't been there um, with him when I was at Rovers and there's a tenacity in his game there's a tenacity just in his general demeanour that makes him a really good uh, part of the squad and I thought he did really well because Dylan Connolly is not easy to defend against he's very quick he's very direct I thought Trev did very well going back the way but I've said it here previously before Raph, 
if you're playing wing back in that Shamrock Rovers team, you should be scoring goals. You you really should be because they have the majority of the possession in in most games. They have such creative players and the likes of Jack Byrne and Graham Burke that if you find yourself in good positions, they will find you. And if you look at how the first goal came about, Neil Ferruja went down the right-hand side and swung it in. And they've done that over the last two years, whereby one wing back goes down one side and the other wing back gets into the box. And Trev is a very good part of, of any squad. Um, and he was that way when I was there. So I'm I'm glad to see him get back to the levels that he was at before he went away to, to Bristol Rovers. And I'm sure working with Stephen Bradley was another gear or two that Trev can go through. Yeah. Let's listen to Bohemians manager De- Declan Devine. We'll just talk about the tactics of the, the game itself because Bo's the performance and the way they approached was obviously slightly different this time. So he, he was also chatting to uh, Tony O'Donoghue. Declan, obviously you'd be disappointed to lose, but uh, our panel are just looking at uh, the penalty decision um, where it looked like Afalabi did touch the ball ahead of Cleary. I mean, have you got a chance to look back at it? I've seen it already. It's a definite penalty. We've seen it in live. It was a definite penalty. We haven't got this season all night, but look. I said it last week, I'm not here to, to, to have a go at referees. Um, it's, a, it's a blatant penalty. Um, it has to be given. It's a turning point in the game. But look, we haven't lost because of that tonight. We've lost because we haven't defended our box twice um, and we didn't take the chances we were presented with. There was even a suggestion, perhaps for Rovers' first goal, that, that Clark might have been offside? I thought he looked offside myself, to be honest. But we got to stop the cross, first of all, and we got to deal with the, the initial contact on the box. Um, that's what's disappointing. Um, but look, I thought our players expanded a lot of good moments in the game. I thought we were very positive at times. Um, we were a bit careless. We were passing at times, which doesn't like us. Um, but really disappointed. We... We didn't take a chance as we had a couple of good chances. Keepers made a great save from Paddy Kirk at, at, towards half time. John's got a chance. He's on one on one with the keeper. Declan McDade's got a chance at the back post. Christian Nowak's got a header just from a set piece towards the end. So really disappointed that we didn't take our chances, which isn't like us. Um, but again, disappointed with two goals we gave away. You started probably poorly from your own point of view and yet finished the first half strongly. And, you know, the second half. You started well. I mean, those are the moments where you really were hoping you need, need to get something in the game. No, that's right. Listen, there's, there's, it's a very difficult place to come. Um, but at the same time, our players have been fantastic over the opening 13, 14 games this season. We've been we're really disappointed we're coming to Italian and losing. Um, you know, this team, this team of champions, been together for a long time. We're together over less than 20 weeks. Um, so, you know, it shows, it shows the mentality within the group that... You know, we, we don't feel that we're ever beaten. We think we can take anybody on in a game. But we'll be hurting tonight because we've lost the Dublin Derby here and, and we'll be hurting tonight. And your your lead, you're still top of the table, of course, but your lead has been kind of slowly reeled in. Listen, it's irrelevant to me, to be honest. We've we've a long way to go. Um, we just have to take this defeat, learn from it, um, tidy up in certain aspects of our game and get ready for another tough game next weekend. Thanks, Declan. Thank you. All right, so that is Bohemians manager Declan Devine, and uh, we'll take a couple of different aspects here. Obviously, uh, we'll chat about the the change in the table, obviously, because now it's just down to one point, both still leading the Shamrock Rovers um, right on their tail. And then we'll also talk about the penalty incident in a, in a little while. But first, just in the terms of the tactics, because I was at the original or the first derby of the season uh, at the start of April, uh, Paul, where Shamrock Rovers, same results, 1-2-0, but it played out quite differently in that Bowes started really well and then Shamrock Rovers, once they got into it, their their you know their quality told as the game went on. Bowes seemed to be a little bit better balanced uh, in the first part of this game. They didn't go for it quite as uh, intensively or intensely as they did uh, at Dalyman Park about a month earlier. Yeah, they were a little slow out of the blocks on, on Friday night and there was a couple of individual errors where you thought they could have been capitalised on. But I thought they they kind of grew into the game, Raf. I thought the midfield three of Flores, Buckley and McDonnell did really well to kind of counteract the Shamrock Rovers midfield, which is where the majority of games are, are controlled. And they grew into the game. I thought their use of the ball was very good, particularly Jordan Flores was able to kind of keep possession in, in pressured situations and just relieve and get them up the pitch. And I thought the only thing that was missing in the first half was a goal. They didn't create a huge amount of chances. And maybe if they created a couple of more, they could have put Liam Poles under a bit more pressure. But they had that chance with Paddy Kirk where it's come out to the back post and Liam Poles had a, has made a great save. 
But I'm sure when they got in at half time, Declan Devine was absolutely delighted with how they were doing um, and just kind of the footholds that they had in the game and how they were kind of counteracting that Shamrock Rovers midfield four. But it, it swung a little. You, you kind of felt like Rovers had a bit more in the back pocket and if they could go through the gears, they might cause them a couple of problems. But really where the game was decided was in both boxes. You know, Shamrock Rovers took their chances. They were able to capitalise on on the chances that they created and Bowles maybe didn't do enough outside of that penalty decision. Um, but I think when they reflect on the performance as a whole and how they've done, I think they'll be relatively pleased with how, how they've played. But tidying up in their own box and like Declan Devine has mentioned there, stopping crosses from coming into the box and then up the other end of the pitch, just being a little more careful with those final passes and and particularly against a side like Shamrock Rovers, has to be so precise in that final third. Yeah, and Rory Gaffney, of course, added the uh, the second goal and it was kind of similar again, be lurking at the the far post uh, and uh, uh, like he did in the uh, in the first uh, in the first derby back in April and then just sort of converting it. But uh, in terms of the penalty decision, Johnny, I mean. Obviously, on the replay, it looks it is, and it is a stonewall penalty. But uh, you know, in the moment, and from your vantage point in the stand, was it as obvious? I mean, obviously, the referee is a different uh, positioning as well. But um, was it as clear cut? Initially, you know, if I'd have been on the touchline and and there'd been the opposition manager, I'd have been screaming for a penalty because it looked like a penalty kick. I think the referee is in a really good position. Paul is in a really good position, but. Uh, you know, and, and he was quick to make his decision as well. You know, the back pass was short, Abalabi got onto it, and he, he's definitely got a touch. But uh, I'd have been really, really disappointed. I, I think, uh, you know, Declan is, is, is adamant that it was a penalty. I was up the top end of the pitch and the uh, far end of the pitch. But initially, to me, it did look like a penalty. And uh, obviously, at 1-0, it's, 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 it's a bit of a game changer, obviously. But um, but just, just with balls, like overall, you know, I think they defended well, as Paul said. I, I think sometimes the likes, the likes of Buckley is better out of out of out of play with, without the ball, and he's breaking down things. Adam McDonald flittered in and out of the game. He's a good player. Flores got on the ball a bit more, but uh, you know they started off the game really, really slowly. I thought Kirk did well down the left hand side, but we always thought Rovers were in control. Chamber Rovers were totally in control of the game. You know, Jack Bourne pulling off to the, the, the right-hand side, as I said earlier on, to try and, you know, make 2v1s, 3v2s. And uh, I thought Ferrugia was very, very good in the match. I thought he really was very direct. And uh, obviously with, with, with the cross for, for, the, for the goal. But uh, I just think overall Rovers, and Paul was talking about, you know, the, the bit in the box, the detail. They probably just better better players all around than, than Bohemians. Declan's made a good point. They're only 20 weeks together. Spoke to Declan, you know, DC where they train. And, uh, you know, his initial thing was to get in, get the players fit, get them organised, and then put them together. And, you know, like the top of the league since the start of the season, I don't think there should be any negatives towards Bowles whatsoever. I think Declan's done a brilliant job so far. There's more to come from them. But Rovers just have a little bit more than them individually, collectively, and as a team all over the pitch. I, I just just on a, a wider point on the refs, lads, and I'll put, to put this to Paul and Johnny, because, you know, after that penalty call, and the referee, I think we can say he got it wrong. You know, I think that was that was a penalty and probably a red card. Now, anybody watching the Man United West Ham game yesterday, where they have, I don't know how many cameras at the grounds in the Premier League, they have VAR. This is the richest league in the world. And I don't know, hell, it's not a handball against Victor Lindelof. I don't know if you, you guys saw that match. but Yeah, he's, he's taken her in his arm, yeah. And so, mistakes are made. It's, it's such a difficult job. And there's been an awful lot of talk about referees this season in the Premier Division because the points being made were the crowds are up, the standard of the football is excellent, the pitches are, are better. Um, and it's been suggested that maybe the, the officiating hasn't risen with the standards across the league that we've seen. But like, I'm, I'm just wondering because... Now we've seen we've seen referee strikes. We've seen referees at, at amateur level, at grassroots level. They can't get people to ref games. You know, like it's such it's such it's all difficult to attract people into ref games at the very lowest level. So surely it trips upwards. You know, if you can't get people to ref games uh, in adult and kids football because they're getting verbally abused, physically abused, does that water down the quality pool? And therefore, it's inevitable that when we get up to the Premier Division, that that you know, the, the officiating is not maybe as, as strong or as good as we'd like. And also, you know, to have sympathy with the referees, it is such a difficult job. You know, it's it's the, it's such a high-pressure environment. Um, 
No, I, I would just have sympathy for them. I, I don't know what you guys think of that on a wider level. Like, it, is it a problem that's only going to get worse? We can't attract people to come in to referee games. And also, just as two ex-players, would you have ever at any point contemplated becoming a referee? I, I actually done the referees course uh, in the FAO. Um, just, just, to go, just to go and do it and to make sure that I understood the reason why referees could make decisions, Anthony. Yeah. And, and, and understanding why that decision was made. It was a bad tackle. It was, it was, no, it wasn't. It was reckless and dangerous. There's, there's, two, there's you know, the detail of why you give the decision. You know, he, his foot was up, his two feet were off the ground, whatever it might be. He, he, the challenge came from distance. It wasn't close in. You know, you hear them talking about players being closer together. You know, so I, I, want, I went to do the referees course to, to understand why they make the decision and the reason for it. And also as a manager, I used to bring retired referees into St. Pat's and explain to the players the do's and don'ts and the why's and why nots of about you know a referee and why he makes the decisions and I would use that as part of my pre season as well. So to, to answer your, to answer your question about the the referees coming in at a, at a lower level, I think they they, they gradually grade the referees really quickly through the system, you know, and even at the schoolboy system where there's good referees and they move them on really really quick and. Uh, but, you know, it's it, difficult for them. But I, I think that's down to the clubs and, and the people that run clubs as well to make sure that referees are safe in the environment of their clubs and their home games and stuff like that and that they control parents and that they control players. And I know from working in Belvedere, you know, hands-on that that's the way it would be, that the environment is right. So it, it's a very good point that you make, Anthony, to make sure that people come into the game. But the likes of... Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Like, were there referees, you know... You know, they, they govern themselves. Do, do we bring somebody else in? I I, I watched Dermot Gallagher on a Monday, you know, on the on the Sky Sports. Do you bring somebody in like a consultant with him to speak to their referees? So who do they look for? Who, who do they look to? Who do they look for answers off and stuff like that? So you need to open open roof for the referees as well. You know, uh, you know, uh, refs go on and, and referee in Europe as well. That's giving them all the experience. But you know, you you got to start start as you said down below. Make sure it's right. And you know, I, I think the refereeing has been good. I think the referees, yeah, they they get the seasons wrong in the Premier League, the Bundesliga. You've just said it there, Anthony. The handball, yes, they the VAR. It's a really, really difficult job. But at the end of the day, is they're not going to change their mind. And for, for players, as I obviously say, the referee doesn't score the goal. He doesn't head her into the back of the net. You've got to play and defend until the game is dead or whatever it might be, and the will report. It's a difficult job. I, I, I don't know whether we could do it. I really don't, you know. Uh, I think they're protected an awful lot more than they are now. I think they're helped an awful lot more. But I think the players and the managers need to work with them. The decisions don't go for you all the time. Us as managers and coaches and players, we want the decision to go for us all the time. So does the opposition. And the referee, the judge is in the middle. And he's got to make a, a, you know, a, a, an impartial decision. I, I never had any interest in ever becoming a referee, but... I think, you know, when you look at Friday night, that's a shocker that, that Rob Hennessy has missed, if you ask me. Given given the position that he was in, the way the ball doesn't really deviate off its path. Like, if that moves to the side, you can tell that Dan Cleary has won the ball. But what doesn't help then is that there's no communication after the game. You know, we all make mistakes. And if Rob Hennessy comes out and says, yeah, fair enough, I actually missed that one. I think people then accept it a little more. The fact that the referees seem to be so isolated away from the game. You know, we hear from players, we hear from pundits, we hear from managers, but we never hear from the referees. And I think that gets under people's skin. And uh, I'm not sure if you've seen any of the stuff that's been going on with the French League at the moment, whereby they've actually mic'd the referees up and then they've done interviews after the games. And it actually gives you an insight into how difficult the job is, but also what it is they were thinking at, it, at that given time. And I think if Hennessy comes out after that game and goes, actually, do you know what? It looked like he got the ball at the time. I may have missed it. It was a penalty and it was a red card. I think that just makes things a little easier for everyone. But I'm with Johnny. It's a very, very difficult job to do. I don't see the attraction of the job. <laughs> Some people do. It wouldn't be for me. Um, but I do have a certain certain element of, of sympathy for them. But there has been one too many decisions 14 games in that the referees have just missed. Yeah, but the thing around the grassroots thing as well, and I guess the abuse levels as well, is also an issue. And I remember talking to Alan Kelly, the, the former League of Ireland referee, and he was talking about the abuse levels even in his time. And he feels like a lot of younger 
um, referees are going to be put off um, by that. But also another thing, another position that's also not always, what well, that is always difficult as well is, of course, the, the role of manager. And we've seen a couple of them step away recently. And Declan Devine was talking about managerial pressure ahead of the derby in relation to Colin Healy at Cork City and then also Tim Clancy at St. Pat's. And um, he said, I've said this before, sometimes clubs need to be careful what they wish for. These guys are spilling their blood and spending their life away from their family to work so hard. It's a difficult job. But expectations in the league are ridiculous at the minute. Cork have come up from the first division, which is not easy. It's extremely harsh on Colin. For Tim, he got into Europe and two weeks ago they were score or they were second in the table. That can happen. I'm very disappointed clubs have come to this decision. But at the same time, we all come into, into these jobs knowing the madness of football management. I think the clubs can get behind their managers a bit more and give them a bit more time. I'm really surprised and I hope the two guys push on to another job in the near future. Now, in regards to Tim Clancy, in the official statement, it was uh, by mutual consent his departure from Pats and with uh, Colin Healy, um, what Liam Buckley, who had just been brought in as sporting director, said it was uh, Colin's call to to leave the position. But, Johnny, you've been there as a manager before over a number of years and obviously you'll know what the pressures are like. I mean, how challenging is it? Even if we go get away from, say, results and what happens in and around what happens on the pitch, but even in terms of dealing with the media, the pressure from supporters, like how is it easy to shut all that out? You know, and, and look, and this is where you go and you do your coaching courses and your licenses and, and I know the pro licenses, that the pro license that you go and you, you do media courses, you learn how to deal with the media, you know, you learn how to deal with the, 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 the media, the papers, you know, the TV, radio, management, running a club, how you run a club, what it takes to run a club, you know. So you, you, you go and you learn all that, but your, your real job is to, is to, you know, the quarter to eight on a Friday night till, you know, your 90 minutes. Look, the, the, the difference here is the industry here, doesn't give you like the boys that left or have left their clubs in recent weeks. They're not going to go away with a package of a half a million euros or a half a million pound in their pocket. You know they're they're doing the job and they're doing as much work as as guys are doing in, in England and without the support structures. So it's a brilliant environment to learn your trade in Ireland in, in the in the League of Ireland because you've got to do a lot of the stuff yourself. You don't have to say have the support structures. You don't have the financial backing from a personal level like the managers in the League of Ireland the salaries are not you know substantial or out there that you could take two years off work when you when you retire Tim Clancy will be out looking for work tomorrow we keep long on this programme recently and uh, you know what a brilliant job Keith done you know at Bohemians and that's the that's the nature and the beast of being a manager you know you take it on board you get engrossed in it I, I had a brilliant way of stepping away from it at the end of games or having taken a day off and people used to say Johnny how can you because you need to step away from it and you need to go home and you need to not you know take your walk back home with you as well you need to and I, I was well able to do that I, I had the ability to step away and I'm not saying not care but just park it for the 24 hours and sometimes when you park something like that and you go back to it you look at it differently and you go, this is why you happened and that's why you happened. Did we prepare properly? Did we not? Not just a, a, a reaction quickly after games and stuff like that. But look, it's it, it's a brilliant job. It's a brilliant... I've travelled the world. I've been everywhere. I've been in international teams. I wouldn't swap it for anything. There's brilliant days and there's also bad days. And, the, you know, there's mediocre days. Like, if you look at managers' records, you'll see 200, 150, lost 78, you know, or whatever, lost 200. Through. So you enjoy the good days and you enjoy the environment of, of, of your team and your club and, and you know, your staff especially as well. And, you know, just, just thinking about Colin Healy and, 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 and Liam Buckley going in there. Some people are not able to take help on board. And I'm not saying Colin didn't want help from Liam Buckley. You know, he wanted to be in charge probably, and I'm just presuming this. But I would always I would always surround myself with the best possible people to do their jobs, to help us as a group, as a team, as a club, to get as far as we could with, with, with you know, with, with the funding and, and the finance that we had. So I, I would never be afraid of, of taking help on board and uh, people thinking that people might say, oh, he's looking for his job. But sure, if, you, if, you're, if you're in that mindset, you might not be in the job, you know? So I think Tim just probably, like a lot of managers, you know, he got them into Europe. 
just didn't happen for him. And the way this league is, you can be, as I say, be second one week, you can be toward from bottom the following week. And it's a bit, a bit of consistency. Just a bit of bad luck for Tim going out as well. And it doesn't mean that these lads are bad player, bad managers or bad coaches. But what they need to do is they need to go away, reflect, and they need to learn. Yeah, and what you said about, you know, the 24 hours that you kind of take away after a game as well, does that involve, like, say, like, you just keep away from the newspapers, like, you wouldn't open one up or you don't really listen to the radio and that because there's always a chance that a sports bulletin comes on, say, on the radio or, you know, the back pages are full of uh, different things. Like, do you just keep away from, like, literally not buy a newspaper for a good while? No, you would, you would, like, if, if, I'm, if I'm as a manager, as a coach, relying on the media to explain to me what happened in my match, I'm in serious trouble. You should know during the match, when the match is happening, trying to fix things, is this going wrong? And you prepare sometimes all week, and sometimes that's why football is football, because it goes completely different than the way, you know, it, it, it's supposed to pan out, and that's that's the beauty of it. Yeah, the 24 hours, of course, we you, you might have a meeting or you'd be talking after the game, but I used to just get away. Uh, next morning, I might even turn in sometimes for the warm down. I might just go for a swim, go for a walk myself, make a phone call, have a think about the game, and then come back to it. You know, because sometimes you make rash decisions or you might say something to somebody. And then when you look at it, you go, wow, it wasn't really Raf's fault. It was Paul's fault because he didn't make that tackle in midfield. It, and it, that was, it, 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 was, it was my fault. Yeah. My <laughs> <laughs> but you know where I'm coming from. So sometimes you, you, it's sometimes good to park it and then you, you go back to it. It's like doing anything. Sometimes, you know, the, the, the old saying, the fella cutting the tree down and, and some guy says, what are you doing? So you're cutting the tree down. See, so would you not sharpen the saw? So you haven't got time to sharpen it. So sometimes you need to go away, sharpen the saw and come back in and you look at it a bit different. Hope that makes a bit of sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then in regards to, you mentioned Liam Buckley, obviously uh, coming in as sporting director, which was kind of coincidental because then Colin Healy uh, left his position just after. So Buckley spoke about, uh, he would have taken the game on Friday against Pats with uh, Liam Carney assisting him. Um, and uh, when he was talking about Colin Healy's decision to leave, he said, it's just unfortunate that Colin has left. I'd have liked him to stay. I asked him to stay. I said, I want to be able to support you. I'm coming down to support the manager slash coach. But ultimately, it was his decision. Now, actually, on the game itself and just where Cork and Pat Surratt, Paul, I mean, I was just looking through stats of uh, in terms of how they deal with going behind. And um, it, it, in fact, Cork uh, have the fewest points after falling behind, which uh, just with just one one point earned. And in fact, Pats have the most with eight in the entire league. Uh, Pats, Cork and UCD have fallen behind the most of any team. Um, and I guess it highlights the quality levels and differences between Pats and Cork that Pats tend to be able to rally a little bit more. And we might have seen that on the Friday night as well. And that Cork maybe don't have the quality to get back into games. Yeah, I think it comes down to experience as well, Raf. Maybe when you got more senior players in a squad, you're able to shut up shop and, and just see games out and, and take points where maybe a younger team will actually let you back into a game. But I, I found it interesting that... John Daly came in and made four changes. You know, John Daly was working very closely with, with Tim Clancy and maybe he saw the starting 11 in a different way the way Tim did. But it, it it seemed like a very entertaining game. I was just watching the highlights back. I think Chris Forrester was very instrumental for both the first and the last goal. And if, if you can kind of get Chris to tick, well, then the rest of the team kind of follow suit and you tend to get the best out of them, the likes of Mulraney, Carty and, and Mark Doyle. So I'm sure Jonathan Daly was absolutely delighted with the win. I think the focus now needs to be getting Joe Redman back into the into the team. It seems that to me that since he's come out of the squad, they just seem to be leaking goals. And if you look at the goals that they can see, like the Olawabi goal, trying to play out from the back, you just can't afford to cough up possession against any team in this division. And then the Whitmarsh goal was just a fail to to clear a long throw. So defensively, they have a bit of tightening up to do. Their back four kind of worries me at times I'm not sure the the most kind of solid outfit in the league but I think going forward Pats are pretty good and um, they've got good options off the bench if you think the likes of Owen Doyle didn't play the other night Adam Murphy came off the bench they have options going forward and they have goals in the team so there's a good basis for whoever comes in to work with that squad and if they can if they can kind of share things up at the back I think Pats could go on a on a bit of a run they've just such a mixed bag at the moment that be good for kind of two weeks and then you don't know what you're going to get in the coming fixtures but on a on another note I worked with Adam Murphy very closely as did Johnny at Belvedere I was absolutely delighted to see him get on the score she's had terrible time with, with hamstring problems that is his game running off the back of defenders when you got somebody like Chris Forrester to, to pick you out 
it was a really well executed goal. Superb finish for a young fella going through and uh, looking forward to seeing more of Adam. Yeah, and then Derry City also, um, they won away um, thanks to a quick crack and finish by Adam O'Reilly. But uh, Johnny, just even looking at the highlights of that game, Drody United, I mean, they could have easily got a point and Draper was right in the middle of it. He hits the crossbar. He has another one saved a point blank range. I think there was another, a third chance as well that, that could have gone in. So it was, uh, it was Derry have tended to get good results away from home, but uh, they really had to work for this one. Yeah, but that's like in saying that, Raph, they really had to work for it. And that again, a bit of experience, you know, to manage the game out, you know, get the three points. Trot have done okay this season. You know, Kevin Dorton, he's a good young manager there. And, you know, we talk about other managers in the league and stuff he, he, with the resources that he has, the finances. And he seems to get a, you know, a, a good bit out of the group that he has. And he's been very unlucky in recent games and probably very unlucky again the weekend not to get something. But look, there you're hanging on to the coattails of, of Rovers and, and, and Bowers at the moment. And they uh, probably just went through a little bit of a, a, a lull spell there. But uh, a, a good win and a big win for them down there with Adam Roydy getting the goal. Good player, Adam. Um, but look, you know, Derry, a big win for them. You know, Drada are going to be down there with Cork and, 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 and UCD and, and, and the bottom end of the table. There's no doubt unless they go on the run. I agree with Paul. I, I think Pat's, you know, will put a bit, bit of a run together. Will it be enough to get them into Europe? Dundalk have gone on a bit of a surge now again. A good win for them. They got their 1-0. It, it doesn't matter. They picked up their three points. Sligo are hit and miss. They win. They lose. You know, so that European spot is going to be really important financially. You know, Pat's, you know, said to Jonathan, look, make sure we stay up. We're okay. I think they'll be fine. I absolutely think they'll be fine. You know, I think it's good that John is 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 with the players that he knows and it's not a huge change going in into the training ground. Uh, will it will it be enough to get them into Europe? I th- I'd hope so. I, th- I, I think they're, they're better than Sligo. Uh, and I say, are they as good as Dundalk getting up there? But it'll be Rovers, Bowers, you know, uh, Derry and after that, you know, the European spot. Yeah, and yeah, uh, get there. yeah, and and obviously big game um, this weekend, Anthony, in regards to Derry going to Bowes and with Shamrock Rovers on a charge at the moment, you re- I suppose it's pivotal for one of the one of those uh, teams at Dalyman Park to uh, get a bit of momentum now to to give chase. Obviously for Bowes, it's not giving chase at the moment because they are top of the table, but um, the way Rovers are going, it looks like they're going to start. You know, they're, they'll overtake and pull clear at some stage. Um, well, look, you you would think so, but I don't think that's guaranteed. Like, look, it's it's a bit of a mad division at the minute. There's only six points between seventh and third, and then only another two or three points beyond that up to to the league leaders. So, um, look, the thing about balls is they haven't had two bad results in a row. You know, I think we chatted about this before. They tended to every time they've lost, they've won the next game. You know, they bounce back quickly, which is a really really important quality in terms of and a very encouraging one in terms of them having sustained success this season and success for Bohemians this season like they finished in the top three rack that is a great campaign uh, for Declan Devine it really is so I thought he was very uh, he was measured in his post-match interview with, with Tony O'Donoghue after Friday night like it would have stung them to lose that match particularly the penalty uh, decision but um, I thought he was he was he was quite measured and I think that's that's We've seen that from him this season. This just take it as it comes. They're doing very well. Um, nobody would have been thinking about a title challenge at Daymo Park before this season started. So I don't think they need to get too wrapped up in that. Now Derry City is a different kettle of fish because that absolutely would have been the aim off the back of the cup win and everything. They're the team to challenge Rovers. But they, like Shamrock Rovers are an excellent side. I think even on Friday night when the game was in the mix. And it was mentioned in commentary, I think Alan Colley mentioned it, the fact that they, they had done a good job in containing Jack Bourne, Bowles, but John Grover was Brian Bork on the bench. You know, you bring on a player like that and suddenly it's something else of outstanding quality to worry about on the pitch. So that squad depth is, is the thing that kind of marks them apart. But I, I think they will drop more points. I don't think they're going to just keep winning now from now until the end of the season. So... I think it will be open. I think will be, I don't see Rovers racing. I think we're at Rob Shamrovers will win the league. I don't think they're going to just race away with it, but it, it does obviously depend on the likes of Derry City and Bohemians to, to not tail off. Uh, so it is an interesting game. Um, and, you know, it's an opportunity. It's a tough game for balls, but it is an opportunity for them to, to bounce back again and, and sort of show that they're not going anywhere. You know, they, they might actually stick around 
uh, and at least still be in the conversation with half a dozen games to go. If they do that, they'll have done exceptionally well. You know, they really will have. As I said, I think a top three finish for them would be brilliant. Yeah, Anthony, just, just right. on that, Raph, sorry for cutting across you. I, I know, you, you know, what Anthony is saying, you know, what, what Bowles has done and what Declan has done, and I mentioned, Declan mentioned the 20 weeks. Declan is learning. He's really only learning about his players. And whether you win, lose, or draw matches, you learn about your players, how you trust them, you know. And over this period of time, the 13 or 14, whatever games, you know, he's learning all the time about his players. Whereas with Rovers, that is there. It's a machine. They've been there for the last four or five years, whatever it might be. So, you know, and I think for both, this can only build. It can really, really only build. I, I think Shamrock Rovers, and I, I, I really do, I think they could go unbeaten all season. I really do. I've seen them in the last five matches against different oppositions, the UCDs, Pats, Bowles twice, you know, see the Derry match. And I really think they've the ability at the high standard they play at that they could go unbeaten all season. Mm. Don't mean they win every match. But are, you they could go out, are you ruling out the 2 1 win then that Derry had in Tala? I'm telling you. No, well, I mean, from now, Paul, from the bad start, apologies, <laughs> from the start, from the bad start that they've had. That you go unbeaten from now to the end of the season. Sorry, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll re, re quote that. I, a boy, I, just, boy, Paul yeah. Curry. <laughs> I, I think on that, I think Bowes or Derry need to stay close to Shamrock Rovers at least up until the European campaign. Like that Rovers team are absolutely planning for another pop at a group stage. And we all know the the kind of travel that goes into that, the mental and physical toll. I really think you need to be within striking distance that if they are to slip up, that you can take advantage of that. Yeah, and Paul, just on the mid table before we touch on the first division. So obviously Shell's got a good win. Um obviously albeit narrow against uh UCD. They're just now they're seven unbeaten. Shane Griffin with a good finish there. But then in the other game, um Sligo and Dundalk, where Keith Ward gets a, a late header and uh you know um, Sligo's inconsistency continues, but Dundalk obviously get a positive result. How do you see that mix at the moment in terms of where teams are? Because it's very it's hard to keep track on teams other than say Shells who are on an unbeaten run, but um it seems it's a mixed bag of inconsistency in there. It is, and you're right, Raf. There's this sort of a pack in there in the middle that seem to have the same sort of form whereby they'll they'll drop points, but shells are probably one that have gone under the radar. You know, the fact that they've gone seven without being beaten is is magnificent. Um, you can really start to see the building blocks, I think within the the overall project of when Duff has gone in and maybe just put the the sort of structures around the team, making them difficult to play against, difficult to score against. I think there's a bit more belief and there's a bit more creativity in their play now. In possession of the ball, I think they're much, much better than what they were last year. And the final piece of the jigsaw is, is just to be a bit better in that final third. They still don't score enough goals. We've touched on Sean Boyd being out, which doesn't help. But just general creativity in the final third could go up another gear. And if, if they were to do that, I mean, they've got a really good side and they're doing really, really good work there. The goal from Griffin was was taken well and they didn't create a huge amount of chances, but it all came down to the save that Connor Kearns has made from Alex Nolan. He was in the dying moments of the game and it's from point blank range and how he managed to get a hand to that and tip that over the bar, I do not know. Without a shadow of doubt for me to save the season because it comes at him so quick and the reflexes were, were just so strong. And I was just listening to Joey O'Brien after the game and he's right in saying that, you know, those sort of moments define keepers whereby he's not had a huge amount to do, but when he's needed, he pulls off a, a top save. So shells are going very strong. Um, with Dundalk and Sligo, I probably expected Sligo to, to win that game. I know Johnny Russell came out before the game and said he expected a home win. I've liked what they've done. I've liked their their general play. I think they're, they're quite good at moving it through the thirds. Again, don't keep enough clean sheets. I think they've kept one all season. And when Keith Ward is scoring with a free header from seven or eight yards out, uh, you know, defensively, they've they've dropped the ball there. But it was a well, well-taken header. For me, I, I kind of looked at the league table after the weekend and I couldn't believe that Dundalk were only six points behind. It feels like they've dropped so many points, but gone on a bit of a run now. They've um they've difficult fixtures coming up, but it's just such a mixed bag. You don't really know who's going to come out of it. But Dundalk, you would think, will, will pick up a bit of form. 
Yeah, and in the first division, uh, in the big game at the top, Galway United go 10 points clear now after beating Waterford 2-1. Cole Ramblers, uh, really good form this season. Um, they're third at the moment, 4-1 win over Finn Harps. Treaty United beat Athlone 2-1. Wexford and Bray drew one all. And uh, Kerry FC still looking for that first win. Now, they have a couple of points on the board, but uh, Longford went uh, down to Mount Hawk Park and won 3-2. Now, in the uh, in the Galway-Waterford game, obviously, Edward McCarthy and David Hurley put Galway way in control um, before Ronan Coughlin uh, got a late goal and uh, I mean it, I don't again like as we said with Shamrock you, as you said with Shamrock Rovers uh, Johnny you kind of expect them to go unbeaten from here on in towards the rest of the season uh, in terms of the first division you don't want to be calling things off but a 10 point gap at this stage it's it's massive yeah it looks like they've got off to a really good start and then uh, Johnny be happy with that it was an important win it was a big win for them and uh, you know, there's not that too many shocks. I think I think War- Wexford beat Warford recently, didn't he? One nil. So you know yeah. that would have been disappointed for Keith. So there's not too many shocks in the first division, and it looks like Galway are on a roll now. And as you say, they they should have enough to go all the way and get get the promotion and win the league and, and come up. Unless the wheels fall off somewhere along the line, but uh, John will be building obviously for next year and and and, and getting them ready coming into the Premier League. Uh, and it, it, it's a difficult jump, but. Uh, you know, Galway have so much going for them over there with, with, the, with the ground, you know, and the support that they would get over there. They'd definitely be a good addition to the league. Who comes out with Probably UCD at this age. But uh, look, Waterford, you know, Keith will put his, 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 his stamp on this Waterford team and uh, I think they'll chase them. It is a huge gap at the moment. I think Shane has done really well at Cove, you know, with again, down at Cove, a difficult job. But uh, they'll take points along the way. But, yeah, I think Galway for me will will, will definitely run out winners. Yeah, and Paul, in regards to Waterford as well, I mean, I see there was the news um, on top of the John Walters is uh, exiting his role as Waterford and Fleetwood technical director after six months. But in terms of what Keith Long has to do there, I mean, they're kind of safe in second uh, for the moment. And there is obviously that huge gap to Galway there as well. Given the nature and structure of the division, though, I suppose there is a kind of long-term um opportunity there to you know to build ahead towards the playoffs if that is what uh, it ends up being and that the gap to Galway is insurmountable that at least you can start planning for that and make go one better than they did um, last year it was a bad week it was a bad week for them Raph I didn't see that Wexford result coming and psychologically the result on Friday in a way I'm sure that Waterford squad are, are looking at Galway and how well they've gone of late to say the 10 points is a huge gap to try to turn around now Given how well how well they've gone, but yeah, listen, it, it could it could be a long sort of end to the season whereby they might find themselves in a playoff position and almost guaranteed a playoff position as of now, and maybe don't feel as if Galway are in striking distance. But all all they can do is is continue to win their games. I think Keith, like Johnny has mentioned, will put his own stamp on that squad. He might have his eye on one or two players that he might want to bring in when the window reopens, and just kind of continue to tick along with the fundamentals of what he wants to bring in. Hope that Galway drop points and, and then in the games where they play each other, hope that they win and they can close that gap. But I felt psychologically Galway winning that game was was big because it just opened up that gap and probably put them with such a gap that Waterford maybe feel like they're out of touch. Yeah, and in the women's Premier Division, P-Mount still top, but they weren't playing at the weekend. They would have had a bye week. And uh, Shelburne, the reigning champions, beat at loan 1-0 away from home. Shark Rovers beat Cork City 5-0. Galway United, who have been brilliant this season, level on points with P-Mount now at the top, beat Treaty United 1-0. DLR Waves lost uh, 2-0 at home to Wexford, who really needed a win to try and get some momentum back. And then Bowes beat Sligo 1-0. And uh, just on Galway, uh, United's brilliant start. So Phil Trill, uh, the manager, um, he would have been promoted from Galway WFC assistant to United manager and has been to good effect. And uh, he and also the captain, Lindsay McKee, were chatting to Jonathan Higgins after the game at the weekend. So let's listen that and look we're enjoying it. it the young players just kind of bring this fearlessness to you because as you know you get older it's more of a head game really so the girls are coming in they don't co- care who they're playing they're just, they're just enjoying playing ball and obviously the addition of Gemma Jamie from Canada and the girls coming in from America it's it's a good mix of experience and youth look we're enjoying it long long way to go yet but we're just taking it game by game top of the table now at the moment as well our level on points with Piedmont that is you know remarkable I don't think too many people outside of the camp would have thought we'd be saying that sentence, you know, at the start of the season, perhaps. 
yeah, look, we, we knew we knew no one was going to kind of say, oh, Galway are going to do well this year. And we just felt like, look, let's prove people wrong. We have no pressure. Same as like Piemont are an unbelievable team. That's why they're top of the league and they're our next game. So we'll prepare well. We'll go. We'll feel there's no pressure. Pressure will be on them. And look, we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's a, probably not getting too focused this early in the season on the table, but you are level on points. It's a remarkable achievement. I'd probably go as far as saying maybe not too many people outside of the group thought we'd be saying that sentence at this stage of the season but how, how are you how are you pleased with, with you know are you on course or how, how do you think things are going so far it is of course a new identity almost also as well yeah I actually think we're probably a bit ahead of where we, we, we thought we would be um, which is a great thing to say you know um, I think there's so much more room for growth uh, it, it's brilliant to be able to be at this stage of the season and again not many outside the group gave us credit um, but you have to go and earn that as well you know you really have to go and earn that I, I think these ladies have earned that and um, you know now more and more people are paying attention to us and the fact that we have so many young players coming through and we're, we're fresh impetus um, and we're getting more supporters with, with obviously being part of Goal United has really helped with the Maroon Army coming in as well um, look I think I think it's really positive we can be very proud um, but you know it's very early in the season for, for us to be kind of resting on any laurels um, we'll focus we have two we have a week off now next week um, and we'll go and focus and try and prepare for Piedmont as best we can. Yeah, it is a sticky run of fixtures. Obviously, you have to play everyone, but just the way the, the commuter comes out there, Piedmont away, Rovers away, and then back at home with Shelburne, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a challenging time for your squad. Yeah, it definitely is. And obviously, the leaving cert as well is going to play impetus because we're so young. Um, but, you know, them ladies have to, have to look after themselves in terms of leaving cert and, and mind themselves because we're, we're really interested in their, in their career as people. Um, you know, but look, I, I think... You probably would have said the same going away to Shelburne and then away to Athlone four days later, a month ago. Um, so we won't really fear anybody. We, we, we'll go and we'll play and we'll, teach, we'll treat each game, I suppose, on its own merits and play the way we want to play and l- let's see what happens. Congrats again, Phil. Something special is brewing here. Thank you. We're brewing up a storm. All right. So that <laughs> is... Uh, <laughs> yeah, golly night. <laughs> yeah, uh, golly night manager Phil Trail and before that the captain, Lindsay McKee. And uh, just on this, Anthony, just in regards to the league and the importance of teams stepping up last year was that loan that did it but um, Galway United making that step forward and you know garnering good results putting themselves in and among the the top teams uh, in the league it's important for it um, that that does happen it is yeah absolutely shades of that loan from last season and it's great you know the league is teeming with young talent um, the Galway are well represented in Ireland underage teams. Like the Ireland under the, the most recent under nineteen squad, they had four players in that squad. And, you know, when you hear Phil referencing, they've got the leaving sir coming up, and that could impact probably training and preparation. That's kind of shows you, you know, that they, they're young, and um, but there's some excellent young talent in that league. Tara O'Hanlon at P Mount United, she was in the USA with, with Vera Pell's Ireland team recently enough, and she came on in the second game, did, did very well actually. She was only on for about 10 minutes, but she did really well. Um, Jane Thompson and Shamrock Rovers has turned a lot of heads, another very, very strong young player. Um, but yeah, fair play to Galway. Look, it's the usual suspects at the top that we would have expected P Mount Shelburne, Wexford Youth, and obviously Shamrock Rovers. You know, they, they picked up so much talent in the offseason. It's their first year back after I think nine years they have been out of that league. but everybody expect them to do well and they are doing well and I think they are actually going to be the team to beat. Johnny yeah. talking about the men's team going on an unbeaten run. I think they okay. They haven't been beaten yet. You know, they're very, very strong. But it's great to see Galway doing well. You know, it is. It, it mixes it up. As, as I say it all the time, like that league is so open every single year. The last few years, it's gone right to the wire. Two, three teams in the mix right to the final day. Um, and hopefully it's the same again this year and I think it will be. Like, And you just, we'll see if Galway can sustain it, you know. Uh, how long they can keep themselves up there and in the conversation, but they've done very well. Yeah, yeah. And then on Tuesday we've got champ- live Champions League, the semi-final first legs. So we've got Real Madrid versus Manchester City on RT two and the RT player on Tuesday night. And uh, Madrid are coming into this having won the uh, Copa del Rey at the weekend, beating Osasuna. Um, in a game where they weren't entirely convincing, Osasuna gave them a good run for their money, but uh, Real Madrid, as they tend to do, um, got over the line and they weren't even con- that convincing against Chelsea. Um, however, as we know, Real Madrid in domestic competition and what they do in the Champions League, doesn't it, it, they're not really tied together. So, uh, Johnny, I mean, in terms of how Manchester City and Real Madrid, um, you know, how they match up, where do you see the scales tipping, especially in this first leg in, in Madrid? 
Well, you know, I, I think City can go to Madrid and get this tie done and dusted. I really do. You know, uh, I think they can definitely get at them. They've, the midfield especially is, is obviously a really, really important area. The pitch, you know, like I, I know Groves played the weekend, Modric, uh, but uh, they're getting old. The, the legs are there for, for Madrid. You know, the, you know, Junior Benzema and the uh, up top, like I mean, they 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 can do anything up top. The, the top half of the pitch for Madrid, absolutely, you know, anything can happen. They're serial winners of the Champions League, yeah. But I just think this city team, what they have, you know, the groups that they have, you know, Gunda One's on fire at the moment. The Bruyne is the Bruyne. He's so consistent. He's there. You know, the, the players coming off the bench. Uh, but I I just think you know, obviously with Holland, um. They just too much for them. I just think City have absolutely too much for them, and uh, I think they can go to Madrid on, on Tuesday, and, and I think they can substantially, you know, get a, nearly get it across the line, get, get a win, and make sure that they go back to, to, to the Etihad and make a handy for themselves. I just think they're just too good all round the pitch. I really do. As I said, I think Madrid in, in, in the top part of the pitch, absolutely excellent, fantastic, and. Uh, um, team got two goals, Sydney, for them in the cup this weekend. Yeah, Rodrigo, Rodrigo, yeah. Rodrigo got two goals. So, you know, as I said, with Benzema Jr., the, them three can, have absolutely can do anything. As I said, the midfield, the legs, even, you know, at the, at the back. Um, but for me, Man City absolutely could steamroll these over the two, over the two matches. I really mean that. Yeah, and Paul, just on that kind of physicality and midfield is one area, but actually just on the evolution of Manchester City and the size of the players in comparison to say the more technical team that Pep would have started off with. I know it's been kind of discussed a, a lot recently, but um, that might play a part as well. I mean, you look at Haaland, um, he's uh, he's obviously massive. And then, the, you know, the back line, especially now that they're kind of playing a tree and even John Stone's playing a little bit further forward in midfield. It's a squad that's not just technically brilliant, but actually like just physically um, huge as well. It's something that has been kind of brought up in, in the last couple of weeks. Even when they line up before a game, there's there's a size to the squad now. And in, in previous years, you're probably worried for them under under pressurized moments in set pieces. And you know, would they kind of capitulate when the ball's put in the box? But you add a Kanji and you add Haaland into that squad and put Diaz and Stones. I mean, there's there's a lot of height there to go attack a ball. And, it might help them in situations like this, like they capitulated last year in the Bernabeu, conceding two goals late on. And maybe there's a bit more just physicality and there's a bit more leadership in that team that could maybe see them through difficult spells when maybe they're not going to have possession, which is is naturally going to happen when you're playing top teams like Real Madrid. I kind of agree with, with Johnny. Um, I've watched a lot of Real Madrid this year and you, you just wonder, like, is it going to be the Real Madrid that turned up in the Champions League last year or is it the one that's kind of been inconsistent and littered with inconsistencies in La Liga? Um, you just don't know. But I think City, the way they're they're rolling into games at the moment, they've just got so much going forward and complete control of games. They've got Haaland at the top end of pitch. Grealish looks like he's in the form of his career. And when Ilkay Gundogan and if De Bruyne, if he plays, are contributing as well, they've just so many different weapons that they can attack you with. And the question you would have then is, can the back three deal with the pace of Rodrigo and the pace of Vinicius? Even Valverde, I throw in there as well, like extremely powerful player who can cover the ground. Pace has always been the one thing that that City have struggled to deal with when they play so high up the pitch. So that will be interesting to see how it pans out. But I just think they've too much. I I think over the course of the two legs, I'd, I'd agree with Johnny and I hope we're not wrong because uh, we'll both look a bit foolish, but I think I think they'll go through comfortably. Okay, and then the other uh, on Wednesday, Anthony, I mean, the colour of a Milan derby, that's uh, what people are going to be looking forward to. So Inter Milan against uh, against AC Milan, it doesn't really matter who's designated as the home team, obviously, because they play they both play in the San Siro, but um, even looking at the colour of Napoli and uh, their celebrations when they won the league. I mean, it's a it's a grand occasion, especially for two clubs that maybe in, in at the European stage had fallen away um, over recent times that they're back at that level because they're obviously iconic uh, iconic clubs. Absolutely, an iconic clubs, an iconic fixture, incredible ground, and yet <laughs> it feels like Real Madrid Manchester City is the final. You know, with all due respect, 
Um, I mean, that is a huge game. Of course it is, the a Milan derby. And they're just, I don't know, like they're so terrified to lose, the two of them. You know, there's nothing worse than losing to your city rivals anyway. But in a game like that, it's, I think it would be two very tense, pagey games. But you'd have to say, like, I mean, all eyes are on the Real Manchester City game because, and this is the other factor for Manchester City, if they can get past Real Madrid, whoever comes through that Milan match, you know, they're, they're going to be very, very strongly fancied to finally get over the line. Um, I mean, it, it will be, we've seen the Napoli celebrations, but any of the games at the San Siro um, in the Champions League this year, are, it's, it just looks incredible, you know, and there's, there's two such illustrious names, um, but, it's, it's it's just hard to look past that City Real game because it does have the feel that the winner of that tie is going to kick on and and lift the trophy. All due respect. It's it's, it's funny talking about AC Milan. They, they only played Shamrock Rovers was it three years ago? Yeah. Yeah. Was it three or four? So have they progressed? <laughs> 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 it's quite it's quite a leap uh yeah to go from the conference league really or the, the Europa League all the way yeah. to Champions League semi finals. Against Shamrock Rovers, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> so the pots and bowls. <laughs> but um just regards to San Siro actually, Anthony, have you ever have you ever been or oh, yeah, Johnny I mean, or Paul? I haven't been, no, no. No, no, no I I've been to I've been to, uh, to Florence, I've been to Florentina and stuff, but no, I haven't been to Milan. Yeah, it's on uh, that one. That one's on the bucket list for sure. That, the, 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 the celebrations in Naples. I was in Naples, and uh, the celebrations was unbelievable. It's fantastic, and uh, I'm delighted, you know, for, for for Napoli, you know, getting get getting the championship and stuff like that. And uh, that kind of living down that part of, of Italy, they kind of they look as if they're forgotten about. You know, they look. They think people look down on them down there and stuff. So I'm delighted for them and uh, to compete against the the, the joint of Italian football. Yeah, for sure. But uh, before we go, later this month, the Fastnet Film Festival will be taking, de- or taking place down in uh, Skull, West Cork. And one of the short documentary films is football related. It's called Noxer and tells the story of Bohemian's amputee footballer, Donald Noxer Blyg. Um, here's the uh, trailer for the film. Nobody says to themselves when they're a young kid, uh, I want to be a drug addict. Or I want to sleep on the streets break down family relationships. I want to cause people pain and suffering. I want to lose one of my legs from drugs. Oh, my kidneys failing. I was going to be different because I was going to be cleverer. But unfortunately, um, it wasn't to be the case. All right, so for more information on amputee football in Ireland, visit irishamputeefootballassociation.com. And for more on the film itself, check out at Knox or Doc on Instagram. But it just reminded me of an interview I did many years ago. I think it was around 2017 with uh, Chris McElligot, uh, who was a league winner at Pats with you, Johnny. Um, uh, um, he's involved in amputee football. He's done great work in terms of promoting it. But obviously, you'll remember him from your time playing alongside him. Chris, he's a great guy, yeah. Uh... And uh, Latin Bally Moon uh, came into St. Pat's for us and uh, could play in a lot of different positions centre half, mid centre midfield. He was a holding midfielder before there was holding midfielders, and uh, he could play left full, right full. But uh, as I said, uh, I remember one day we uh, were playing at Lowndes, the keeper was sent off, and uh, Christy Green goal he saved the penal, he went on and won the league. So <laughs> claim the fame for Christy, but no, a great guy. I was in touch with him over the weekend, wishing him luck. Yeah, for the for the victory before the victory against England and I'm delighted for him he does brilliant work there absolutely brilliant work yeah and I think for people who want to look at one of his old goals I think didn't he scored a 40 yard screamer against Monaghan United I think that's on YouTube I don't know if you remember that or if you were involved in that match Jeez, I don't know I can't remember that one I don't remember that one <laughs> there is, I, I believe there is video I do remember writing about I'm it I'm sure so it's there it, so it's, it's it's happened it existed at some point I, I think anyway but get anyway. it up get it up yeah, look, uh, once you're finished watching this on YouTube, obviously you can go and uh, then look for that goal. And I'm sure there's lots of other things to, to discover there. I'm sure there's bits of Johnny McDonald playing as well that uh, people can look up as well. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that, bring, that brings us to a close. Johnny, thanks a mil for taking the time. Paul Corey as well and Anthony Pine. Thanks, thanks guys. Well.